Well, welcome to the uh, 25th Annual Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz Lectureship Series. The Fleet Admiral Nimitz Memorial Lectureship was established in 1983 to enhance the spirit of collegiality and sense of community to the university through the multidisciplinary subject matter of national security affairs. The Fleet Admiral Nimitz Memorial Lectureship annually brings to the University of California at Berkeley a distinguished scholar, a professional military person or government official for a series of lectures on specific national security subjects. It provides a better and fuller understanding and awareness of national security concerns in the light of the geopolitical balance, world economics, advanced technology, and other critical factors. We have a tremendous opportunity this week to do just that. This year's guest lecture exemplifies all those things that we strive during, to uh, obtain during the Nimitz lectures and more. In addition to her distinguished academic credentials, she brings with her some very real-time, hands-on experience from the field that will provide a keen perspective on the issues at hand. Ambassador Barbara Bodine served over 30 years in the U.S. Foreign Service and primarily worked in the area of the Arabian Peninsula and Greater Persian Gulf issues. She specifically worked U.S. bilateral and regional policy issues, strategic security issues, counterterrorism, and governance and reform. Ambassador Bonin is currently a lecturer of public, public policy at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, where she teaches courses on the Iraq War. She also serves as director of the school's Scholar in the Na Scholars in the Nation Service Initiative, an innovative intern and fellowship program for students pursuing careers in the Foreign Service. Her most significant Foreign Service tours were as Ambassador to the Republic of Yemen from 1997 to 2001, as Deputy Principal Officer in Baghdad during the Iran-Iraq War, as Deputy Chief of Mission in Kuwait during the Iraqi invasion and occupation of 1990-1991, and again, only seconded to the Department of Defense in 2003 in Iraq as a Senior State Department official and the first Coalition Coordinator for Reconstruction in Baghdad. In addition to several assignments in the State Department's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, she was also the Associate Coordinator for Counterterrorism Operations and subsequently the Acting Overall Coordinator for Counterterrorism. She served as the Director of East African Affairs, the Dean of the School of Professional Studies at the Foreign Service Institute, and Senior Advisor for International Security Negotiations and Agreements in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. Since leaving the government, Ambassador Bonin has served as Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Governance Initiative in the Middle East at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, as a Fellow at the School's Center for Public Leadership and its Institute of Politics, and the Robert Wilhelm Fellow at MIT Center for International Studies. She also serves as the President of the Mine Awareness Group America, which is a global NGO that provides technical expertise for the removal of remnants of conflict worldwide, and as well as a member of the Washington Institute of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador Bodine is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Secretary of State's Award for Valor for her work in occupied Kuwait. She is a graduate of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I am both very pleased and most honored to welcome as our Nimitz guest lecturer this year, Ambassador Barbara Bodine. Please give Ambassador Bodine a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that very kind invitation and, and for the invitation to speak uh, this year as, uh, as, the, Nimitz as the Nimitz lecturer. Um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, the other evening, um, I was raised in a Navy family, and so this has a particular uh, importance to me. I'd very much like to thank uh, my host tonight, first of all, the NROTC midshipmen. Uh, I want to thank them first, um, as well as the, the UC Berkeley Military Affairs Committee and Dr. Spice for his sponsorship. Uh, Captain Laird, thank you again uh, for, for organizing this. Um, certainly to Lieutenant Gillespie, who has done a magnificent job. Um, and also to the midshipman rep, uh, representative to the Nimitz Committee, uh, Midshipman Witt. So thank you all very much for this invitation. Um, the 
Oops, if I can do this without, okay. Um, the two uh, lectures that I want, I'm going to be, I want to give this evening and tomorrow evening um, are to look at what are some of the new threats and challenges that we face um, as a country in the 21st century. And then tomorrow night to look at what are some of the tools that we have to address those threats um, and what are some of the tools that we need to, to, to develop and to fund going forward. So in a sense, um, in, in the State Department, we talk about our job being the uh, formulation and implementation of policy. So tonight I'm going to be talking on the formulation side, and tomorrow night I'm going to be talking more on the implementation side. Um, back in the day, we used to calculate um, our, the threat by throw weight, missile gaps, competing blocks, and, and alliances. We talked about the need for a 600-ship Navy, the latest generation aircraft, missile defense shields. Size mattered and technology mattered. Wars were planned for the wheat fields of Poland, the deserts of Iraq, the oil fields of Saudi Arabia, and uh, the cold waters of the Northern Pacific. The Cold War may have been a battle of ideas or ideologies, but the enemy was measured by competing brute force. It was a conventional analysis of a conventional enemy with a reasonably conventional aspirations of territory and resources and a conventional response. We won that war, uh, the Cold War, but instructively not by force of arms unless you count spending your enemy into the ground as force of arms. There were non-conventional threats and non-conventional wars, but they were considered the exception. They were sideshows, proxies, so even somewhat exotic. They provided great fodder for movies and for superheroes, but they were somehow inferior ad hoc and distractions. They were lesser than and tellingly referred to as operations other than war. They were the unwar. We didn't train, equip, plan, or spend for unwars, for operations other than. Counterinsurgency was for snake eaters. Nation building, if done at all, was for the faint-hearted civilian. Peacekeeping operations were for militaries from countries too weak or irrelevant to fight in a real war, and diplomacy was for wimps. We were war fighters, not peacekeepers, and we didn't do nation building. We did not have the doctrine. To have had the doctrine would have, had, would have been to concede an ongoing challenge and an ongoing threat, and non-conventional threat was not amenable to a conventional response. If somehow we didn't acknowledge it, it would just simply go away. So every operation other than Somalia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Haiti, and Iraq was ad hoc. Times have changed, and the question is whether we have. There's a debate in Washington right now, not over just the size, but the configuration of the defense budget. Not only is it a question of what can we afford, um, but also, what do we need? The poster child for this debate, in addition to the president's own helicopters, is the F-22 fighter aircraft. A, 19, a 2006 article that I, for some reason, still have, recounts the effort by Senator Saxby Chambliss to extend Lockheed Martin's contract for the F-22, a system that was described then as the most expensive, least needed weapon system in US history. The Air Force had begun development of the F-22 in 1980, 10 years before the fall of the Soviet Union and before most of my hosts this, this week, the NROTC midshipmen and the cadets from the Air Force and the Army were even born, and probably before even some of their parents had even met. The F-22 met a threat that no longer exists from a foe that is now long extinct, and there is no comparable threat on the horizon. Regrettably, the right honorable senator from Georgia won his battle in 2006, and the F-22 remains on the budget. Um, it is still stunningly expensive. I wish my own house had appreciated it at the same rate, and it is equally unneeded. The Air Force hasn't been in a decent dogfight in years. More regrettably, the F-22 is not alone. During the Rumsfeld era, defense procurement policy married the strategies and assumptions of the Cold War with the technology of the new century. We went even more high tech. The Rumsfeld Doctrine was predicated on the belief that technology would trump. 
We were so snazzy, so powerful, so asymmetrical in our own way, that with too few troops, we could shock and awe our way to victory over a demoralized, poorly trained, poorly led, and poorly equipped military that had neither the will nor the ability to fight. And we won that battle, and God save us if we hadn't. But we came very close to losing the war, and the final judgment on that isn't in yet. We were, in a sense, locked and loaded and ready for the wrong war. Many of the systems under scrutiny today are 21st century versions of weapons that have been in our arsenal for decades, and they go back even further. Almost all of them are versions of technology that presume armies and navies facing off in some sort of formalized version of warfare. Who could shoot faster and farther won? The last time anyone made a serious attempt to review procurement was in the early days of the Clinton administration in the glow of the end of the Cold War, the end of history, and what his predecessor had called the New World Order. There was even a procurement holiday on acquiring and modernizing weapon systems. That holiday didn't last very long at all. A defense analyst countered with what he called the Revolution in Military Affairs, RMA, has to be an acronym, which stated that high-tech weaponry would transform the nature of warfare as gunpowder and nuclear weapons had. Backed by the business executives for national security that included the senior representatives from most of the defense industry giants and a very assertive Republican Congress, the holiday became really little more than a lost weekend and defense budgets soared. The systems that were paid for were not designed to meet the operations that were straining the post-Cold War military, the peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace-enforcing mis missions, the little wars, but high-tech systems to fight a threat that we didn't have and to main a, maintain a superiority that wasn't challenged. I recently found in my files, I'm obviously a pack rat, a PowerPoint presentation called Peering into the Fog, Looking for Shapes in the Future. And the basic thesis was that the world is changing more rapidly than our institutions and our concepts for coping. It set out increased stresses at home and abroad, characterized by growing economic disparities, collisions of culture, race, and religion, environmental deprivations and calamities, diffusion of destructive powers. It said further that the scope of disasters would be growing geometrically while our own institutions were being eroded. And it projected risky ventures such as disaster recovery, humanitarian assistance, and civil security. This was not going to be a new world order, but a growing ethnic chaos. Interstate, interstate wars would be in decline as intrastate warfare increased and there would be a devaluation of the traditional ends of war, territory and resources, to be replaced by existential contests keyed to race, ethnicity, and religion. These would be aspirational wars as opposed to territorial wars. It also asked if we were working the wrong side of the national security ledger, and it did post some dichotomies such as a few big wars or a lot of little nasty ones, interstate versus intrastate, sovereignty versus aspirational, and destructive versus constructive. And final question it asked was, is our, is our military to be war fighters, police, or social workers? In other words, was it destruction of the threat, management of the violence, or remediation of the root causes? This PowerPoint presentation was not post 9-11. It was not post 2003 Iraq. It was done in 1994. 15 years and two presidents ago, and about the same time as the revolution in military affairs. 15 years ago, we were able to peer through the fog sufficiently to know that the old order had gone and that our concepts for coping were still mired in conventional thinking. Over the past 15 years, we have not fought a conventional war anywhere, yet the lessons that were enshrined in the U.S. Army Marine Corps Field Manual on Counterinsurgency was a process of rediscovery and reinvention, not just simply one of revision. If we snatched a reasonable, acceptable outcome from the jaws of a fiasco in Iraq, it was not because of our high-techiness or simply more boots on the ground. 
To follow the old ways we had learned would not work. An insurgency that was perhaps inevitable on some scale spun out of control. Any definition of victory, political, military, or strategic, became a relentlessly receding dot on the horizon. And as the insurgency flared, a country teetered on the brink of a fragmented civil war, otherwise known as anarchy, and the specter of ethnic cleansing appeared. All of our high techiness did not serve our troops or our national security goals. And to borrow a phrase, we went to war with the army and the doctrine that we had, not the one that we needed. We were again locked and loaded and ready for the wrong war. Lessons were learned the hard way on the ground in Iraq by those who fa faced the battlefield reality that did not compute with what their post-Vietnam era senior officers, their training, or their doctrine had prepared them for. It is important that we learn the right lessons from Iraq as we assess our new threats and our new responses. Fundamentally, it was not a question of the number of troops, but the way they were used. A fundamental redefinition of their mission, their mandate, and their doctrine. A shift from the primary focus of destruction of the enemy to the protection of the people. There was also a relearning of the basic truth that in unconventional war, the military can lose on its own, but it cannot win on its own. There are other lessons to be learned, and historians and strategists will be exploring these for decades to come, including questions of unilateralism, the distinction between a preemptive and a preventive war, civilian military collaboration, and the need to plan for the day after. Oops. In the 21st century, if those are the basic lessons, then I think we need to also then step back and see where and how they're going to be applied. In the 21st century, the greatest threats to the United States, to our security and our prosperity at home and our security and our national values abroad, will not come from standing armed forces of a strong competitor state, such as the Soviet Union or China, or even from aspiring regional powers such as Iran. It's going to come from instability within and between the weakest states. The new violence we face is not from powerful adversaries so much as vulnerable, fragile states imploding from a perverse lack of legitimacy, an inability or in unwillingness to provide basic services, basic structures, and a basic social compact with their own citizens. These imploding states will be marked by violence and humanitarian misery, at a level unacceptable and sometimes unimaginable to us. They will constitute a threat to the peace and security of their neighbors, and they can spawn non-state actors who, either in opposition to the misery or as a root cause of the failure, will exploit the vacuum for their own pernicious transnational purposes and spread the violence and the threat even further. Interstate violence is not always content to stay within its own borders but it always maintains the potential to become interstate and even transnational. These will be civil wars, secessionist movements, insurgencies. Weak states serve not only as incubators and safe havens for what was called the diffusion of destructive violence, but also for the exploitation of ethnic and racial and religious identities, environmental degradation, pandemics, and scourges such as child soldiers and human trafficking. This is not an appreciation of the future, but an assessment of current realities. Incoming Director of, well, incoming Director of National Intelligence, Admiral Blair, declared at his confirmation hearings, and again last week in hearings before the Armed Services Committee, that global, the global economic meltdown poses a greater threat to the United States than terrorism does. CIA Director Panetta now includes an assessment of the global economic crisis and its cascading impact on the vulnerable states and societies in the President's daily intelligence briefing. This is not an assessment of problems that we, uh, this is not just an assessment of problems we all face as we watch our own economy crumble or the reverberations of misery of this meltdown on fragile states around the world. It's also an assessment of the kind of instability that these implosions will precipitate. There's two corollaries to this new threat from weakness rather than strength. 
One is that the continuum from violence to, from, of threat and violence, inter, intrastate and external, will be longer and more ambiguous than with conventional threats and conventional interstate violence. The good news is that this allows for greater opportunities for conflict and crisis prevention and mitigation prior to the requirement for military intervention. The second corollary is that the concept of clear post-conflict breakpoint for a shift from military civilian will be equally ambiguous. There is not yet a consensus within this country or the international community on whether and at what stage and how to respond. Whether it is a pre-crisis or early crisis responsibility to protect, what its friends call R2P, a mid-crisis right to defend, or a full crisis UN sanction obligation to intervene. But there is a recognition that this threat from fragile states cannot be ignored. If the threats to the United States and our interests and our values come from within the weakest and reflect political, economic, and social dislocations, then the tools at our disposal must also address the, re the roots of these threats. The response may require military force, but it will not be the military first, rarely the military alone, and very improbably will it be conventional military. What for too long the military and defense planners considered unconventional warfare has therefore become the new conventional. Uh, going back to the counterinsurgency manual, despite the primacy of the political and the need for civilian agency partners during the stabilization phase, and I recommend all of you to chapter two of the manual if you haven't read it, the net conclusion does remain a military lead. And to a certain extent, this is understandable and appropriate. The Army and the Marine Corps cannot and should not write the manual or set the doctrine for civilian agencies. The default to the military lead also reflected the perception that the civilian agencies cannot or will not be full partners. And it, this is a reflection of the imbalance, particularly in resourcing, but also mission and mandates that has grown up over the past few years. The question becomes whether the imbalance and the lack of coordination is inevitable, irreversible, if the shift in lead um, is necessary in the current context, and whether the fundamental interagency process is antiquated and so broken that it needs to be replaced. And tomorrow I'm going to get drilled down onto those questions and look at what is the toolkit for responding. But I want to go back and, and tonight look more closely at what are some of the, the nature of some of these threats. The economic issues, the identity issues, the environmental issues, the diffusion of, of destructive power. And I want to look at it through the prism of one particular part of the world, the Gulf, or as they've just tried to rename it in Washington, Southwest Asia, uh, which is that stretch of land, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. How do we get that? I don't, this is a fascinating map and I have no idea. It's really old. Um, this is not where we're going, that's where we were. How do I get this thing back? Back arrow. Back arrow. Back arrow. Ah, cool. I'm State Department, we don't do techie stuff. Just do that right down there. Um, anyway, I wanna look at it from this, from this area of the tri Tigris and the Euphrates to the Indus Valley. Um, the Southwest Asia is, a, is, is maybe technically accurate. I don't particularly like it. It is confused with Southeast Asia and it overlaps with the Middle East. And anytime we on the outside start drawing lines in the sand in that part of the world, it is always hazardous. To be clear, so I'm gonna stay with the Gulf and what I'm really talking about are the six states of the Gulf Cooperation Council and their immediate neighbors. The Gulf, we have a tendency to think of as a what, not a who, and we, can, we tend to think of the Gulf as something that is dependent on us. If Americans think of the Gulf at all, they have a tendency to think of Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, maybe Florida, or Dubai and indoor ski slopes. Women in black veils, old men with glowering visages, and young men with guns. The Gulf is that foreign oil that we must become independent of. To our military, it is one near contiguous chain of military bases. 
But to see the Gulf as, as one of their dependence on us is incomplete. We are very dependent upon them, not just for oil, but to prop up our economy and our currency. Our military is dependent upon access to and support for the bases and facilities that operate there. And we tin cup the Gulf states to support pet projects and pet regimes around the world that have very little direct relevance to them. We talk about lessening our dependence on foreign oil without thought about what that would mean to either our access or our influence. Without question, this string of mostly small states experienced a windfall of wealth over the last four or five decades and at a very dizzying rate in the last year. But it is also true that their economies now teeter on a crash along with the rest of the global market. Their stock markets are crumbling, their real estate bubbles have burst, and credit has dried up and there, many of them are facing budget deficits. It is true that some of their windfall fueled a building and buying spree unparalleled elsewhere in the world, and some of it was frivolous. I have seen the indoor ski slope in Dubai, and it is frivolous. But it is also true that beyond the outrageousness of Dubai, uh, that most of the building was in the, six, in the 70s and 80s, and most of it was to take these states from having almost zero infrastructure to bring them into the 20th and 21st century. It is also true that our dependence ex extends beyond their oil and beyond the military. We, um, our economies have become increasingly interdependent, and as I said, they are taking hits right along with us, and that therefore behooves us to understand these states much better. They face a number of challenges that fit in with some of the earlier ones that I, I mentioned. The challenges are not unique to either them or to the rest of the region, and the ramifications extend to all of us. The challenges they face include things such as demographics, education, employment, political space, regional players, and identity. They are tightly interrelated domestically, but there's the impact of these and their severity and the tools that each of these states have to respond varies considerably. Demographics. This is a very young and growing population. Almost 40% is below the age of 15. The majorities are under 25. They don't know their parents' world. They don't remember the Gulf pre-oil. They've never known an Israel that was not an occupier, and they've never known Iran that was not a theocracy. They have no recollection of the Soviet Union or the invasion of Afghanistan. They have grown up with a belief in their entitlement to a certain standard of living. They expect jobs. And they have the fervor, the passion, and the absolutism that tends to characterize the young. They are an economic and a political time bomb. Employment, there is a need to create tens of millions of jobs to absorb this youth bulge. They already suffer from unemployment and underemployment. In the Gulf, their economies are high tech, not labor intensive, and agriculture is not an option. The government sector can only absorb so much. They see education as a birthright, and for the best and the brightest, they go to our very best universities. For the next, our best universities are going to them. But the quality of their secondary education is substandard for the demands of their own 21st century economies. They were bypassed by the Industrial Revolution, and their challenge now is not to be bypassed by the knowledge or the information revolution as well. Brings me to the next set of challenges, and that is reform. Someone's got their cell phone on. Um, reform in, in, this, in these Gulf states and in a lot of these areas, the, there is a very dynamic debate going on, much of it outside of our understanding and, and very much underneath our radar, on what is going to be the relationship between the government and the governed. There is a, a consensus that to go back to the 19th century is probably not the best option. They have tried any number of Western models and found them wanting. And there is an understanding, however, that the status quo can't be maintained, that this is a very different generation and that they need to move forward. What they have not decided yet is what that option D is going to look like. Right now, the regimes and the fam ruling families in this region have proved to be extraordinarily adaptable and flexible, far more so than many of the so-called republics. But 
their ability to continue with this adaptation if their economies start to contract is going to be a major challenge. Oil wealth can be both a curse and a blessing. For most of these Gulf states, it has been a blessing, and it has been one in the recent past that they have managed to spread to the rest of the region. But again, as the global economic crisis continues to hit them, their ability to maintain their investment strategies, their labor, the employment creation that they are doing in the rest of the Middle East, which is important to our interest, is going to be called into question. Um, I'm going to skip over this, I want, because I want to get to the last major issue, because I think this is, this is a core issue in this region and around the world, and it really does inform these new threats that we have to, we have to deal with, and therefore the tools. And that is the question of identity. Um, identity is central to all of the new political realities and to the, all the new vulnerabilities in the 21st century. Indeed, it is one of the key problems in the entire developing world, as there is a quest for genuine and, and, and convincing inclusivity uh, within some sort of a nationalism or a national ideal. If we go back to the basic elements of those shapes in the fog, if we go back and look at the elements of the new violence, nationalism and identity politics, or the lack thereof, or the disintegration thereof, or the search thereof, this lies at the heart of the instability of economic disparity, of the collision of cultures, race, and religion, and the diffusion of destructive powers. It is the aspiration in the aspirational warfare. Um, and even though it may not cause national, natural disasters, it can very much affect a state's response. Identity politics is at the core of Iraq's descent into chaos. Our inability to understand identity politics, I think, led to many of our fatal mistakes in Iraq, and how the Iraqis ultimately defined their national identity is going to define their future. Identity is the gin behind ethnic chaos around the world. It is the operating assumption in Huntington's clash of civilizations, and it shows itself in things like Rwandan massacres. I don't want to leave the impression that it is wholly a negative, it can be the dynamics of a very pluralistic society. It can create the centripetal forces that can hold a state and society together, as well as the centri centrifugal forces that pull it apart. It is a very powerful force that most Americans are uncomfortable with and don't, are not able to project onto other societies. It can be a positive role in its broadest and most meaningful, in creating a broad and meaningful unit of cohesion it can also be narrow, intolerant, racist, and can become the lead horseman of the apocalypse. In the Arab world, the debate rages, often, as I said, under our radar screen as to how this region is going to define itself. What does it mean to be an Arab? Is it language? Is it culture? Is it history? What does it mean to be a Muslim? Are the two compatible, complementary, or antithetical? Is the region culturally and religiously undemocratic, proto-democratic, or a-democratic? Is its future, as I said, in the 9th century or the 21st century, and how does it relate to the outside world? The debates that are going on within this region on identity are not about us or the West. Um, to a large measure, they are a definition in opposition to us, to the, do to the dominant culture and the dominant identity, but they are, at heart, who they are defining themselves as. The new Arabism that has, has emerged and fueled as much by the phenomena of satellite television is a bottom-up identity. It is not a top-down political pan-Arabism that some of us may re remember, not remember, have read about from Nasser. But it is a bottom-up sense of identity quest. It is somewhat narcissistic, and it is also not unified, as I said. There is no single set of policies and orientations. It is driven in part by how they see our policies. Um, it is not contrary to what some people have said, because they hate our freedoms, our values, or our institutions. But there are some severe problems with some of our policies. James Zogby, who is one of the best pollsters in the world, described it as how Arabs view Americans treating Arabs. It is very simple. 
They see their prospects for democracy, for Islam, and Islamic traditions under siege, and they see Western and American hegemony as threatening their independence, their self-determination, and their identity. Graham Fuller, who is another very good observer of this region, takes it a step further and links this new Arabism with the rise of Islamism, or political Islam. The way Islamic movements view and deal with us, in a sense, become nationalist, um, move, nationalist identities. Religion is not the driving impulse, but a communal nationalism is. How we deal with this, how we are able to understand these forces, how we are able to deal with them, and how we respond to them, I think in the future is going to, is going to determine what our relationship is with this region and whether it will continue to be an area of military deployment or an area of political engagement and cooperation. Thank you. We will uh, now open it up for uh, questions and answers. Uh, who's got the uh, mics? And if I could ask okay, we'll have one. to kind of keep your questions to questions. And uh, there's a gentleman right here. Ambassador, you just mentioned that uh, the Arabs uh, view us as a threat. There are a lot of people uh, who view them as a threat to Western civilization because of the dominance of their increasing birth rate in Western Europe and in Russia, and because of a lot of events that have been occurring here in the U.S. and Canada. Are we off base on that? Or? Um, well, I think, yes. Um, I think it's, we do a, a major disservice if we think, I, I do not see either Arabs per se or Islam per se as a threat to us. Um, and the kind of threat that I'm talking about that they're seeing, and there is this, this um, what uh, Shibli Talhami calls a clash of prisms, is one of um, an embattled culture as opposed to a direct military threat. There is a sense of, of, of certainly when they look at Iraq and, and some other places of it being direct, but it's one more of an embattled culture, an embattled identity. Um, I think that you know, if, if we start looking at all Arabs as a threat, all Islam, all Muslim as a threat, that we are lumping an entire culture and an entire region, an entire society, based on the actions of a very, very small group of people who don't represent the mainstream of either this national culture or this religious identity. Um, the vast majority of people in this region, the, certainly the vast majority of people who trace their roots to this region, are not inimically hostile to us. They are not a direct threat to us. Um, there were some, you know, particularly in the last couple of years, this idea that, you know, all Arabs are Muslim, all Muslims are terrorists, and therefore, um, I have some friends that any time they go through Dulles Airport, no matter how many times they go through Dulles Airport, it takes them three or four hours to be cleared, and it is almost solely because of their name. Um, this is not an, an issue of inimical hostility. Um, we can make it one of hostility. We can make it look as if it is one of two cultures besieging each other. Um, having lived most of my life out there, um, there is not a sense of an existential threat to us. There is not a sense of wanting to bring down our system, our values, our people, or anything else. There was a small group that wants to bring down some of our, our buildings, absolutely. But to sort of extrapolate that to an entire region, to extrapolate that to an entire culture, to extrapolate that to an entire uh, religion, um, would be about, would, would make about as much sense as um, believing that you know anyone who is partially Irish is a member of the IR, a provisional IRA. Um, that everyone from Michigan is you know equally culpable for Timothy McVeigh and what happened in Oklahoma City. Um, I think you need to you need to make a distinction between small groups with their own ideology and their own agendas and a culture that they are perhaps exploiting but don't necessarily represent.
uh, the red sweater? Thank you. Uh, we need to get the mic because. The question is, is, is this region, I mean, it sort of reminds me of, of, of uh, Europe, I guess, maybe in the early 1900s, um, and, and, and different uh, uh, countries or, or uh, you know, relationships of countries there that, that, that helped foster World War I. Is, is, this, uh -huh. is this an area that's going to be in this century a place that could foster World War III? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it needs to be. Um, and I think one of the things that's, that's important to remember is that this is a very, very diverse region. Um, the Gulf region is, is one particular political ecosystem, if you like. Uh, the Eastern Mediterranean countries are perhaps another, and North Africa is another. And even within those regions, you have vastly different political and social systems. Um, I don't see it as necessarily being the root of World War III. Um, and I don't think the people there particularly want to be the root of World War, the, the roots of World War III. Um, the kinds of threats that I was talking about, these new vulnerabilities and these new threats, um, are not just confined to this area. Um, in many ways, many of them are, are just as, as pronounced and perhaps even more so in Africa. You have elements of them in, in Asia. You have elements of it in Latin America particularly when you add the global economic crisis and what it is doing to, to undermine an awful lot of governments and their, the perception of legitimacy um, that they have. This does not have to be the Armageddon. And I don't think that it, it, if, we are, if we will engage with it as a region of sovereign states, of sophisticated populations, of uh, partners in global economic issues, global financial issues, um, and people that in many ways we share far more in terms of common values and common goals than we do, than we have differences. Um, the, unfortunately, and, and this is just the nature of, of journalism, um, the most extreme, the most violent, the most horrific is what ends up in the papers. Um, the extent to which there is a debate going on on identity definition within this region, you know, who are we going forward in the 21st century, does not mean that has to be in opposition to us or in conflict with us um, on any level, either cultural conflict or certainly a violent conflict with us. They can define their own identity and it can run in parallel to a Western identity. It doesn't have to be in conflict. And I, I very, very much disagree with the fundamental assumptions and what has been taken from Huntington's clash of civilization. Uh, there are any number of civilizations around the world that are very different from ours, and yet we're not in conflict with them. The Indians have a very different culture. We don't see that as necessarily antithetical or hostile. The Chinese do. Uh, any number of, of, of them do. And so I think that as this region is going through these uh, internal debates and these are in, internal issues of uh, definition, political structure, social structure, we don't need to see this as a conflict. We don't need to see this as a threat to us. Uh, we don't need to see this as a source of violence against us. Um, we can create that um, by creating this sense of, of um, besieging their culture, that somehow we do see it. I mean, one of the ironies of, of Huntington's clash of civilizations is that many people in this region, and I think some other regions, saw, this, saw that almost as a declaration of war on them, um, and a sense that uh, we were there to, uh, that, that we had a war on Islam, we had a war on Muslims, we had a war on their societies and their traditions and their cultures. And to the extent that they found, found themselves besieged, you do have a tendency to get a reaction. Um, and so part of what I'm talking about is engaging with them as they are and allowing them to develop. I, I don't think that this is 19th century. These are very sophisticated states. These are fully formed nation states. 
um, even though the, I, there is an element of Arab identity debate going on, it is not at the proto-state, proto-nationalistic level. Um, these states exist, and these, nation, these, these national identities exist. There's just a deeper identity debate going on, but it's not hostile to us. It's not a threat to us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, with the rise, I mean, with uh, China and Russia asserting them, trying to assert themselves as an econ as economic and military superpowers, is there a chance that they will attempt to expand their spheres of influence into the Middle East? And if so, will that sort of exacerbate the um, cultural and political tensions within the region? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, Russia is, 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 is constantly trying to get back in the game. Um, and I think the rise of China, and, and I would include India. I'm, I'm much more interested in the rise of India and how it plays in this region than I really am in the rise of Russia. Um, if nothing else, geography you know, keeps the Russians pretty far away. Um, how to put this? Um, there is going to be a growing multipolarity, uh, economic and in terms of some of the strategic relationships. They're not, again, necessarily hostile to us. Um, the Chinese are definitely major players uh, in terms of energy consumption and therefore partners with, with this region, uh, as are the Indians, um, but not necessarily in a, in a geo-strategic sense and not in a way that is a threat to us. In fact, I personally think that the Indians could very well end up being the next guarantors of the Gulf region. Uh, we inherited it from the British when they left. Um, I am not convinced that the American dominance in the Gulf is um, an, inter an, an eternal uh, proposition. Um, and if you actually start looking at what other regional powers could come in and be guarantors for some of the smaller Gulf states who do look at some of their bigger neighbors, uh, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, and wonder, you know, are looking for some kind of guarantors, that the Indians could actually be a very suitable um, next generation security guarantors. Um, the Indians and the Chinese coming in don't create the same sort of um, issues of the Western hegemon hegemonic is just such a tired word, but um, you know, um, but the sense of Western domination coming through. They don't come in as, as uh, seen as competitors. Um, they seem they, they are seen as coming in and being far more accepting of a local culture, a local tradition, a local structure, um, and less directive on trying to change the situation there. So in that sense, I think they, they will be seen as, um, you know, they're already major economic partners. Major strategic partners, I don't see the Chinese expanding their, their strategic reach this far. I do see the Indians. I don't see the Russians really expanding their, their strategic reach this far. Will a lot of the states in the region try to, uh, not try to, are a lot of those states in the region um, diversifying their various strategic alliances and partnerships? Yes. Um, and again, I don't see this as necessarily bad. I don't see this as necessarily a threat to us. Um, this is not our property. We don't own it. Um, and I think there is something to be said for a number of states in the world believing or seeing that they have a strategic interest in the security and the stability of this region. Uh, that actually can add to the stability and the security rather than acting as a destabilizing force. Yes, sir. Uh, congratulations on all your achievements. Thank you. Uh, Excuse me. Sir? Uh, sir? Just perhaps. Sir? Oh, congratulations on all your achievements. Uh, this requires perhaps uh, uh, some speculation on your part regarding your background and experience. However, and I do accept uh, 
this identity crisis, if you will. Well, identity issues, it's not a crisis, but go ahead. Thank go ahead. you. Whatever clarification's required is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Presuming Iran obtains a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. will they become a force to tar, not necessarily with the United States, but a force to tar relative to an identity solution to the crisis of identity within the Middle East? Um, Iran is, is a major player in this region already. And, and if, you know, just simply looking at the map, um, no country that large, you know, cannot be a player. Um, whether or not we're dealing with Iran, everyone else is. Uh, they are, they would like to play a greater role than they do, um, irrespective of whether they have nuclear weapons. Um, and that goes back to the Shah that is not a post-Khomeini, post-Iranian revolution ambition. It's a very long-standing um, ambition. Uh, they are an element in the debate in the sense of um, that element of the internal identity debate that comes down to what is the role of religion in politics. Um, Islam has a much greater role in day-to-day -day life than it does for most people of either Christian or Jewish background or anything else. So the question of how do you bring you know, religion, Islam into your political life um, is one of the core elements of this, this debate that's going on. And Iran as the only theocracy out there um, is at least a, not a model to be emulated um, but does inform some of the debate. And in fact, some of it is, this is not where we want to go. We don't want a theocracy. Um, so as, as the Iranians have set up, we don't want to be ruled by the mullahs. We don't want to be ruled by, by what they see as a, as a somewhat medieval um, ideology, um, political philosophy. So in that sense, it, it, already, identif it already informs it. On the question of, of you know, if we have a new pan-Arabism um, that recognizes nation states and recognizes national identities, it doesn't, it doesn't trump, I'm a Kuwaiti, I'm a Jordanian, I'm an Egyptian, I'm a Moroccan, but it kind of underscores it in a slightly different way. The Iranians are not really players in that debate. Uh, they're Persians, uh, they're Iranians, and they're seen and see themselves as very different. Um, whether or not they have a nuclear weapon is I, is an issue of concern to the countries in the region, um, but they don't see the Iranian if the Iranians decide to go for a weapon, and that is a question that is still hotly debated by intelligence people. Um, they don't see it directed at them in any event. One of their, their the two concerns that they have about uh, the Iranians deciding to weaponize their nuclear capacity is one is a very simple one as I was in Ku I was in the Gulf the end of January and the Kuwaitis uh, point out that the the major Iranian nuclear facility is right across the Gulf from them and um, they're very concerned about a Chernobyl like accident uh, and they asked the Iranians at one point if their technology was Russian or French or Japanese or where they were getting their nuclear power plant technology, not weapons, but just power plant technology. And they said they were not at all uh, relieved to hear that it was Iranian technology. Um, <laughs> this was not the answer they were looking for uh, because the way the prevailing winds go, that if there was a nuclear, if there was an, a Chernobyl-like accident in Iran, it would hit the Gulf states. So that's their first concern. Their second concern is that if Iran were to weaponize, um, what this would do in terms of outside powers, us or someone else, trying to come in and deny them that capability militarily. And you can almost take the concerns about a Chernobyl-like cloud um, as a metaphor 
for their concerns about um, any military action to try to stop the Iranians from having nuclear weapons, that the, the response to that would also end up on their doorstep. Uh, so they're very conflicted over that. And what they would prefer, um, and there, there is that Iran be allowed to go ahead with a nuclear capacity, a nuclear capability, um, nuclear power, that's fine. Um, and that there be some sort of accommodation between Iran and the rest of the world that the Iranians don't feel compelled from their own point of view to go weaponized. And so what they're hoping is that there is a political accommodation that keeps the weapons issue from happening, from, being, from coming on the table. Um, from the Iranian point of view, they are, going to go, they are going forward with weapons, with nuclear technology, weapons capacity. Um, and that's a done deal. That's, that's happened. So then the question becomes what do you do if, it be, if, it, if they become weaponized? And in that case, to be perfectly honest, it's going to be an issue of how do you live with it? Um, because there isn't going to be a way of taking out the Iranian weapons capability if they get that far. Is there? Oh, uh, we, the, I actually, my host must get questions. Uh, good evening, Ambassador. Uh, you mentioned uh, the importance of identity in the Iraqi situation and how mm -hmm. that's resolved. I was wondering, do you foresee um, a unified Iraqi state or uh, in the foreseeable future a breakdown of relations between the various ethnic groups and maybe the formations of smaller ethnic states? Um, I think Iraq is going to hold together. Um, I was a believer that there was an Iraqi identity prior to our going in and that the, uh, and this is what I meant by our lack of understanding about their identity politics led to a lot of our mistakes um, and, and certainly helped fuel, uh, maybe not create, but certainly fuel uh, the violence and, and the, the descent into anarchy. Um, but there always has, there has always been a very strong Iraqi identity. Um, and I think one of the things, and this gets back to this whole question of, of identity politics, is that we don't seem to be able to give them credit for being able to hold multiple identities simultaneously. And, and I, play a, I play a very nasty game on my students every year where I ask them to give me five descriptions of themselves. And I'll get, you know, New Yorker, um, soccer player, history major, on and on and on, stuff like this. And I'll say, well, you know, it's, it's interesting that not a single one of you mentioned that you're a Princeton student. Well, they didn't need to mention that because that was a given in the room. And so I think one of the mistakes that we did is when we talked with the Rockies, they would identify their other identity, not an over, well, you know, not, not the, the, um, the overarching one, because that was a given. And we overplay the sense of, of identity politics. And I remember when I went in with the coalition reconstruction forces, there were these maps, and they drove me nuts at the time, and they still do. And I called them the blip maps. And it was a, a map of Iraq, and there was a blip at the bottom that was green, solid green, and it was the Shia. And there was a blip in the middle, and it was orange, and it was the Sunnis, and there was a blip at the top, and it was blue, and it was the Kurds. And they were homogeneous, you know, um, um, monolithic blocks. And there was no sense that there was a difference between a rural Shia and an urban Shia, that there were secular and, and highly religious, that there were an enormous amount of, of intermarriage, of mixed neighborhoods, on and on and on. And we put them into these three simple little boxes. And then we set up the power structure so that your identity was what determined whether you had uh, you know, an opportunity for power or that you were completely out of power. So we set up identity politics in a way that, that really didn't reflect uh, the core Iraqi sense of themselves. I think they got all the way to the edge of the abyss in 05, and, and they realized they were on the verge of, of falling apart. Um, and they walked back for many of their own reasons. We were fortunate uh, that we had a change in doctrine and leadership at the same time, and it worked uh, well. 
But I, I do think that you know, a rock is not going to fall apart. Um, the tensions are going to remain uh, within the groups. There are 27 different ethnic and religious groups in Iraq. Um, unfortunately, many of the very smaller ones have left. But I think Iraq as a, as a unified state will survive. And I think that one of the, this is one of the reasons that we need to get into more regional strategic politics, is that it is a shared goal of all of Iraq's neighbors that it also remain as one. And so, yeah, I, I see it going forward. I don't see Iraq as being, it is, it is going to be a fragile state. It's going to be a vulnerable state. It is probably going to have a dysfunctional government for a very long time. But there is a difference between a dysfunctional government and a failed state. And, and I think that we're going to have to accept the former and understand that doesn't necessarily mean the latter. Way in the back. I think it's Air Force, but I'm not sure. I can't, you've got a great big light on you, so I can't quite tell. Oh, there's two. OK, there were two. Then we'll get the other one. Go ahead. Good evening, Ambassador. I'm Midshipman First Class Hooper from the California Maritime Academy. Okay. You talk about how we need to work with these countries as they develop their own ideas and identity and work with them so it's more cohesive. But how do we deal with the situation of victims from a shattered society and uh, government in Somalia who take to the seas and hijack hmm. hundreds of ships, hold them from ransom, and the military, or the, uh, as I was, the religious warriors who go out and attack ships like the Limburg, both have ramifications on the US economic and global economic mm -hmm. scale, but they both come from completely different backgrounds. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, as I said, Thank you. there are one of the problems that if, if these answer, if these questions of economic disparity of fragile or failed states, and certainly Somalia is, you know, it's been a failed state for at least 15 years. Um, it can absolutely spawn various kinds of lawlessness, various kinds of violence that are threats to the peace and stability and security, not just of the people in that state, um, but in surrounding states. And the Somali pirates are, are a perfect example of that. Part of what drives the Somali pirates is, is not, the fact, not just the fact they have a, a, an utterly failed state. Um, they have no, no economy. Um, they have absolutely nothing. And I'm certainly not defending pirates at all. Um, you, need to be, you need to have the forces and the structure and the capacity to be able to, to um, address threats to security around the world. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way saying that we don't need a military, that we don't need armies and navies and air forces, and that there aren't threats out there that need to be addressed. Um, what I'm really trying to get at is that we also need to sort of uh, look at what are the root causes and try to figure out how do you get at those at the same time. Um, I think you have to, and, and this is a very difficult issue, but trying to make a distinction between what is violence that is coming from a failed political, economic, social environment, and what is an ideologically driven um, uh, kind of violence is, as Al Qaeda is. I think there's a difference between how you deal with what are the root causes of Somali piracy, while you're also dealing with the piracy. You have to deal with both, and, and how you deal with something like Al Qaeda. Um, so those are very different, and you have to be able to make those kinds of distinctions. Um, on, the, you know, on, on both terrorism, piracy, and, and some of these other issues, one of the comparisons or analogies that I've used in the past is to think of a, um, a neighborhood that suddenly has become or has, has become very crime infested. Um, you know, with, with you know, drive-by shootings and, and all sorts of stuff going on. Um, first of all, you don't tag everybody in that neighborhood as being part of the crime problem. Uh, they are as much the victims um, as, they, as, as, as some of them may be the perpetrators. You do need to have a police force that is able to go in there and get the serious bad guys off the street and in the jails. 
Uh, absolutely. But if you don't do anything about why that neighborhood, what caused that, then you're going to be picking guys up off the street corners forever, but you're never going to turn the neighborhood around. Now, you can't go in and try to turn the neighborhood around if you still have you know, major gangs um, um, operating. So how do you do both? How do you recognize both? How do you make the distinction between who are the kids who are joining the gang because they need an identity, because they need some kind of protection, whatever is driving them into that, and who are the serious leaders? And so it's that same, I would use that as a metaphor for what, what we need to do in terms of how do we address some of the potentials as well as some of the actuals of the new violence, the new threats, and the new challenges. And there was one that was straight back there. You're, you're kind of right on the other side of the red light from the camera from me. You, 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 you. <laughs> Hi. Um, in the uh, declining global economy, do you see an escalation in violence between Israel and Palestine in the possible future? And if so, how could that affect the U.S. economy or war, war state? Yeah. Um, Israel-Palestine. Um, one of the decisions I made early in my career is to specialize in the Gulf. Um, <laughs> uh, there is an economic element to the Israeli-Palestinian problem. There is certainly going to, has to be an economic uh, component to any long-term solution to that problem. Um, and, and to the, in those periods when, when it, it has looked more hopeful, um, has, it, it has been coincident with times when um, there has been a sense of some economic hopefulness on the part of the Palestinians, uh, not just political. Um, so it's, it has to be part of the package. And, and there is no such thing as, as a purely political solution. There's also no such thing as a purely security solution to it either. Um, one, other, one other element, and I think this is something that, that it certainly predates um, the global economic crisis, and, and it'd be easy to start blaming everything on that. Um, but a lot of these issues certainly had their roots going, going much further back. Um, but a new issue, an issue of increasing prominence and increasing instability, and one that we really do not put enough e emphasis on, is the whole issue of corruption. And I think as you see societies um, under stress, from the global economic problems, you're going to see greater corruption, you're going to see greater intolerance for corruption, and you're going to see greater instability because of that corruption. Um, and for too long, we have never, we have not addressed that as a major destabilizer in societies and a major threat to security. And it certainly was an element in the Hamas victory was the corruption of, of, of Fatah, which we chose not to recognize. And tomorrow, we're going to get into, um, if these are all the problems, what are the solutions? Um, or not necessarily the solutions, but um, what are the tools that we need to have as a country, as a government, as a society, to address these broader kinds of threats, to try to address them before they become a crisis where the only tool left is to send in the military. How do we get ahead of the curve? How do we do conflict prevention, resolution, or mitigation before we have to do crisis intervention? So that's what I want to talk about tomorrow and what kind of tools do we not have, do we need, and how much would it cost uh, to do it? Thank you. Thank you.